I'm, I'm really going to take you on a quick canter, if you like, across a broad landscape because I think this new field of regenerative agriculture is uh, incredibly exciting and um, offers some of the big solutions to some of our big problems. And uh, I'll try not give you indigestion before tonight's meal. So, as I'll be discussing, we are, our, our planet has moved into a new phase and, and the new agriculture has some of the best solutions to the associated problems. Just quickly, I come from southern New South Wales in Australia, temperate grassland, farm, 2,000 acres, fine wool merino sheep. In a big year, we'll bring in cattle to mulch in the grass. And nearly a quarter of our farm now is devoted to conservation uh, purposes, which means we have animals like that, uh, over 140 bird species, uh, one of Australia's rarest reptiles, bottom right, and, and the echidna is one of only three species in a unique mammal family of primitive mammals. They lay eggs, but they suckle their young, and the more we regenerate our grasslands, uh, the more echidnas we're getting. So, And I also have the privilege of working with uh, what Americans would call a, a medicine man, but we call a senior lawman, senior Aboriginal elder, talking about people who've managed dance, landscapes in Australia for over 60,000 years. And I'm sort of in kindergarten learning with this guy. We annually do an autumn burn and um, he can tell me what our landscape was like before basically uh, we European settlers buggered it up. And that's a precious thing to know what we might be able to aim for in healthy function. So that's my message, very simple, uh, sounds exaggerated, but I'm going to justify it. If we can develop healthy landscapes, healthy landscape function, from that comes healthy food and fibre. Shouldn't forget the fibre aspect. And we're also finding now healthy profits, healthy people, and as I will argue, a healthy planet. I'm not going to go through the different forms of regenerative agriculture. Uh, we're seeing some of it here today could be agroforestry, biodynamics, permaculture, etc. The difference between sustainable, um, um, which to me has now become a bit passe, sort of marking time, that word is so overused. Regenerative agriculture implies practices that enable landscapes and systems to self-organise themselves back to a state of health. And if you look at the modern understanding of complex adaptive systems, of which there's a number of traits, uh, that capacity to self-organise within itself to a state of health is critical and, and we're suppressing that with most of our modern industrial agriculture. So big context number one. How do we get into our existential or planetary crisis? We've definitely moved into a new phase and as you can see by those rats, uh, it's not the most comfortable position to be in. <clears throat> so on the left is our blue-green planet. There's only one of them that we know of, not just in the solar system but further. And it's, it's blue-green because life itself created conditions for life. Most people don't realise that. That a bit over three billion years ago it was bacteria that first put oxygen in the atmosphere for the first time. And a bit over 400 years ago the great forest started the beginning of regulation of the carbon dioxide cycle. So it's life has created those unique conditions. And now it's one species, us, they're starting to destabilise those, those unique systems that support life. I personally, was where I'm still a visiting lecturer at the Australian National University, we've got some of the world's leading planetary and climate scientists and they're getting more depressed. And from what I'm seeing, I think this Anthropocene crisis is far worse than any world wars or any other crisis our species has had to come through. It is that serious. And the reason we've moved into this new phase of Earth is what's now being recognised as the Great Acceleration. The post-1950s, if you look in the orange on the left, the socio-economic trends, doesn't matter if it's population, GDP, uh, use of energy, uh, water use, if you like, the number of McDonald's restaurants, they all show an exponential trend of ongoing explosion post the 1950s. If you look at the blue, the Earth system biophysical trends, exactly the same. Not just the atmospheric, uh, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, um, surface temperatures, uh, 
the city, the ocean, they're all doing the same uh, pattern. And that's that impact of we humans and our huge numbers is what's tripped us into this new dangerous phase. And so I'm not going to go into the details. We all get hung up on climate, which now has got to be, become a bit of a block for the sceptics. It's actually nine integrated Earth systems that sustain conditions for Earth. Starting with that thin envelope of protection, the ozone hole, biodiversity. Uh, we're now in the sixth greatest extinction event on Earth, this time caused by us. And uh, climate change, um, ozone, as I mentioned, and uh, the water systems, the nitrogen, phosphorus interrelated function, uh, all of them have now been destabilised. And if you look at the extensive scientific literature, it's showing us that the worst aspects of industrial agriculture, if not a major player, is the major player in disturbing those, those systems. But there's a, a flip side to that. And if that sort of a simplifying, damaging approach to complex ecology of our Earth systems is, is damaging things, the flip side is that an agriculture that enables self-healing, regeneration, um, is what can turn it around. And that's why I'm so positive uh, about this new agriculture. So how do we get into the mess? You'll notice I've put a hyphen between agri and culture. Uh, it's because agriculture is all about, um, uh, as one farmer said, that square foot of real estate between our ears. It's our paradigms, our worldviews, the way we trained, etc. Uh, and I can identify with that because I, I set off as what I thought was a good industrial farmer and ended up making mistakes in big droughts. But what I'll, I'll just do is quickly skate through the phases that's led us to the modern period. And you can look at the evolution of agriculture from 10 or 12,000 years ago as a series of uh, ongoing cycles of agroecological transformations or innovations. And beginning 10 to 12,000 years ago, from, from Western agriculture's point of view, in the Middle East, that fertile crescent period. With, and then with simple things like that first plough, the ard, which I'll touch on later, with results like the American Dust Bowl, bottom left. So if you look at that progress, beginning with hunter-gathering, where it took up to 100 hectares to feed one human, the first primitive agriculture, slash and burn, increased that by 10, tenfold, uh, in that it took one tenth, took only 10 hectares to feed a person. And then the first plough cultivation with that ard, uh, a five-fold jump in production, and go on right down to modern industrial agriculture compared to hunter-gathering, a 250-time increase in production. So, and we're now finding that the modern regenerative agriculture can do the same or better, but without the penalties. So that's a huge transformation, and there's been a cost. <clears throat> and I'll quickly jump through to the beginning of the modern Evolution's the wonderful, what's called the triumph of horn over corn, what happen, happened in here in Flanders, uh, beginning in the, the late 16th century, that sort of beginning of the modern agricultural revolution. This time organic, uh, still rain-fed, cultivated ecosystems, led by cereals, but now increasing use of animals, and uh, therefore sort of organic fertilisers with the animals. And then from about the mid-1850s, we started to shift. And so what was happening then was the elimination of animals in our cropping systems, uh, the replacement of organic fertilisers with the new industrial fertilisers and the new phosphates from islands in the Pacific, etc. Beginning of synthetic fertilisers, doing away with fallowing, mechanisation came in. And uh, this, what, what made this, this phase distinct um, <coughs> was that it, it led to the, rise of, the rapid rise of human population and energy use, etc., which is what triggered our modern uh, dilemma. And really, and it also led to now the inculcation of the seven key phases of industrial agriculture. Intensive tillage, monocultures, synthetic fertilisers, intensive irrigation, chemical pest weed control, manipulation of plant and animal genomes, and factory farming of animals. That's where we got to by 1950 to the, to the present day. 
and we now know from the literature, etc., and the physical evidence, it is having huge costs. Unsustainable, environmental ones, massive social costs emerging, uh, which I'll touch on later, enormous costs in human health. And a key factor in us moving into the Anthropocene, separating us further from nature, which is fundamental. And I'm saying this is an immense schism in the history of our species. And in many ways, the beginning of it all was this implement. And uh, as Patrick said, I, I did a bit of climbing. I was in the Himalayas in the uh, late 70s and came across this photo, uh, this guy farming on steep slope. He's actually carrying an exact replica of a plough that was used 10,000 years ago. And I'd, I'd argue that has become a powerful metaphor of us starting to till the earth, which went down to some extreme extent. We're all familiar with Roosevelt's major statement in the middle of the uh, Dust Bowl years that a nation that destroys its soils destroys itself. It's a view of the Dust Bowl there, what was once rich prairies with hundreds of diverse species. A photo bottom right uh, occurred about six weeks ago in Australia where one of our big rural weeklies is advertising a farm. That's meant to be a positive selling photo for good cropping country. <laughs> Um, so that sums up the extremes of where we've got to. Dust flying, bare ground, dead soils. So I'm now arguing we've now moved into the eighth phase of these agroecological transformations. We're moving into this new modern regenerative phase. We know organics has been around for a long while, uh, both with indigenous people and Albert Howard and, and uh, Eve Balfour and all those wonderful people here in Britain, but we're now moving into this exciting new phase which is really what I want to focus on. <clears throat> but the background to it is where our Western agriculture came from, that domestication process. Rich grasslands, 10 to 12,000 years ago in that Middle Eastern area, uh, and where they found these little weedy plants, which we now call the modern cereals. Uh, domesticated sheep and goats there first. And the Mediterranean, had a lot of forests and uh, rich river valleys. Most of the forests are gone, and here's Plato, 360 BC, uh, complaining about the erosion around the, the hills around Athens. That uh, They look like the skeleton of a sick man, all the fat earth, fat and soft earth having been wasted away. Have a look at those nations today. Syria, Iran, Iraq, Libya, top end of Africa, the Sahel, Chad. All desert, constant drought, constant social conflict. That's sort of a 10,000 year summary of what our agriculture has led to and it's a warning um, for us in the present. And the historical legacy is that we're still doing that. Those shots are in Australia. Bare ground, overgrazing, a lot of industrial inputs that are doing harm when not well managed. <coughs> How do we get into this mess? And I'm going to summarise in a very quick minute or so a huge shift. But if you look at those photos on the left, an Indigenous society in Australia, or Broyle, the elders', elders painting of harvest in the 1500s, those cultures were what you could say were of organic mind. They, they didn't see themselves as separate from Mother Earth. They saw themselves as totally indivisible. What they did to the mother, they did to themselves. And then our, our civilization went through that extraordinary phase and this country had a huge role in it, that wonderful phase following the uh, renaissance of the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution, the capitalist revolution, the modern capitalist revolution. Quite extraordinary phase of, of human development and creativity. But the net result when you look around the world today is that we no longer see ourselves as separate to Mother Earth. It's that mechanical mind. We see ourselves as separate. Earth is now a substrate from which we extract profits. That is a huge shift in our cultural thinking. And so when that Western mind uh, hit a naive con continent, a lot older than yours, up to 3.8 billion years old, some of our leached soils, uh, in the, when they first cleared this country, uh, the Eucalypt country, 
and the big drought of the 30s hit, that's how much topsoil was lost from the top, that red arrow. Millions of tonnes over to New Zealand. Now, the Kiwis always flogging us at uh, rugby, so I don't see we should give them our scarce nutrients. <coughs> that photo on the left is only five weeks ago. Another dust storm rolling in from that same country, hitting the big cities in Victoria. And the photo on the right is more dust storms three or four years ago. It's still happening. Because we're bearing the soil and we're overworking soil and killing the biology in, in a nutshell and overgrazing. And that photo again, uh, as Wes Jackson said, one of the great thinkers in America, the ploughshare may well have destroyed more options for future generations than the sword. And if you look at what we've done through that history since that Fertile Crescent period, uh, our form of agriculture has nearly degraded 40% of available agricultural land and it's still accelerating. So, um, bad news out of the way. Uh, there is another way. And I'm preaching to a number of the converted. Uh, and the key is this magic dark brown stuff, healthy, biologically rich and active soil and all the functions that go with it. And I will argue strongly, it's not just about plants. It's plants with animals can restore our farms, our soils, our ecosystems and profits, but not separately is, is the emerging evidence. I'm not talking about monocultures of plants either. And I'm not talking about the plough. And I'm not talking about industrial inputs. But multi-species cover crops, for example, diversity, which is how nature works, Richly diverse grasslands and holistically grazed, mob grazed, whatever you want to call it, with a wide diversity of plant species. So that's how nature works. She needs ruminants in her systems. <clears throat> when I reflect on my mistake-ridden journey, I realise that the mistakes I made was because I was illiterate. I couldn't read a landscape. When I returned to do a PhD uh, in my late 50s, it was 40 years since I'd done an ad undergraduate degree in soil science. In the early 70s, I was only taught chemistry and physics. In 2009, I was only taught chemistry and physics. There's no biology. Uh, and I was illiterate. And I learned from my peers. And they, they couldn't read a landscape either. They did not know how it functioned. <coughs> so where's that view come, come from? That picture on the left uh, was a full-page A3 ad in our big rural weeklies only a few years ago for Roundup, glyphosate. So white pointer attacking the soil, the Roundup drum, uh, sexy eyelids and smile. If you look at the language in that ad, trust your killer instincts. So the, the, the psychologists that these big companies employ, they know how to press our buttons. And it's from that sort of inculcation of idea, attitude, metaphor, uh, that we, we've come to believe we have to dominate and simplify and destroy. And, and it's from that that I ended up having to take over a farm when I was 22 and my father got ill, sought the best advice around, which was industrial, and I ended up doing great damage because I could not read my landscape. <coughs> so to telescope a lot of work by ecologists like Alan Savory, etc., and I've had to teach masters and third-year university students, you can really simplify how a landscape functions down to five key functions. I've added a fifth one there. And I'm not going to go into the detail. You all know about photosynthesis and plants putting sugars into the soil that drives the biology and changes the water cycle. So soil so function, the water cycle, the soil mineral cycle, biodiversity. And I've added that weird group of species down on the right, we humans, as the fifth, the social function. And if you look at those arrows, if you disturb any one of those functions, it's going to have a negative effect on the others, or if you positively regenerate one of them by having more green grass for longer of the year, for example, it's going to positively impact all the others. But in a nutshell, that's sort of a, a uh, 101 on ecological literacy. <clears throat> I'm just quickly going to illustrate some of them without going into the details. So I, I still manage over 2,000 acres of temperate grasslands. I see my role as a manager is to stack on as many uh, solar panels as I can for as long as the, of the year I can, as well as covering the soil, to drive those sugars into the soil, to drive the whole, the whole system, the exudates and the sugars. 
And it was Alan Saver who has been mentioned who cottoned on to what was happening in the big herds in Africa, but also uh, some of the latest thinking in, in, America, in North America is there could have been 80 million buffalo running around. Uh, rapid movement of animals for predators and because of the dung and the urine. Um, the huge animal impact. And Savory, who was an ecologist in the 60s, asked himself, how come these massive animals, this massive mobs have got the healthiest grasslands? And it was from that that the adaptation into mob grazing where humans do the driving of the animals and uh, create the density to create the healthy ecology that that's all come from. And it can be quite remarkable. This is in seven-inch rainfall country in the Karoo area of South Africa. I've stayed with Norman Crew. Sadly, he died not long ago. Now, he was one of Alan Savory's first clients. <coughs> you probably can't see it from the back, but that paddock on the right, which is basically deserts, that's what it was all like in the uh, late 70s when Norman went there. He said he had to walk a kilometre to find a perennial. He immediately started mob grazing. And uh, within about 15 years, he, he ended up running three times more livestock and more than three times more profit. And you can see the diversity, softness, health, ground cover of just shifting to an ecological grazing approach. Same in Australia. Uh, this is subtropical grasslands, North Queensland. There's a red arrow on those two left photos. If you can see them, that's the same tree in that landscape as a marker. And the same story, 100 years of set stocking, too much burning, rock hard ground, big tropical rain, it all runs off, nutrients into the barrier reef sort of story. And within 10 years of shifting to ecological grazing, bottom left you can see the regeneration, ground cover, not just grasslands but shrubs. Uh, it's quite dramatic and, and a, in their case a doubling of uh, stocking rate immediately and a lot greater resilience. And bottom right, gullies that were once actively steep-sided and visibly eroding, healing up very quickly. And an extreme example is up in our northwest Kimberleys, remote country way up uh, North Queensland. Um, no roads in there. This family couldn't buy country, so they leased uh, about half a million acres of country that had been trashed by feral donkeys, huge mobs of feral donkeys and cattle. And as uh, Chris Handler told me, uh, one of the lessees, all we had was solar panels, human ingenuity and uh, using animal impact. And the result is from the top photo of total degradation down to uh, a regenerating grassland, even in that tough country. <coughs> and the same principles are now being found to apply in the new cropping methods. Uh, particularly multi-species covers. I can't speak for this country, but in Australia and North America and parts of South America, they're rapidly taking off. It's where grazing and cropping are combined and managed in a way where each benefits the other. So I'm probably telling you to suck eggs with some of this, but cover cropping uses diverse crops and planting to create mulch, control weeds, and improve soil health by stimulating the biology. And they're called covers because the, the big secret for us grazers and also the croppers is to keep that ground covered so that the sun does not kill that precious soil biology. And, and this sort of mulching impact, which we've seen some of it today, is what builds that soil biology, that maximising that soil health. So these things are remarkable tools. Um, They've got this big zoo in their stomach. Uh, so in places like Australia, when you get a dry season and the biology has died off for one reason or another, these things can re-inoculate a lot of the microbial world. They're unbelievable fertiliser machines. When used well, their feet are great massages. And as we've seen today, they're incredible mowers as well. Fantastic tools. And so by using high-density, holistically grazed livestock in both cropping and grazing, we now have commercial operators achieving uh, similar or better yields than, than industrial, but without the huge expenses of industrial inputs, that they're eliminating those. The spongy, absorbent soils are returning as the carbon returns. Uh, they're protecting that soil. And... Um, 
no time to go into it today, but we now know it's only been connected in the last few years from, with the soil microbiologists. If you get those conditions right in cover cropping and grazing together, you get to a tipping point in the soil and you get hugely rapid changes in uh, the fixing of carbon and the whole function under the soil, what, what they're calling quorum sensing. It's really exciting stuff, this connection. And, uh, and that's what's now leading to rapid soil building and some remarkable increases in carbon. <coughs> so all these functions are connected. This is an example of the impact on the water cycle. It's another uh, one of a savoury group in Mexico, uh, land that had probably been degraded for three or four centuries. And that blue arrow is the same point in that landscape. So degraded, overgrazed, Hard ground, big rain runs into the, into the uh, landscape on bottom left, hence all the water. And then within 27 years of shifting that grazing, uh, that's the result on the right. Wonderful regeneration of all the functions and probably 10,000 times more water in ground in that landscape. And really that's, the, as, as the heading from this American graphic says, the root of the matter is infiltration. Now, if you look at the broad cropping lands of Australia, North America, etc., because of shallow-rooted cereals and the plough or tillage, there's now this massive hard pan. So all those roots, which you may not quite see clearly from the back, your, your deep-rooted perennials and your forbs, etc., creating channels for water and feeding biology, that's all gone. We've got this massive hard pan and dead soil below it. A uh, huge thing to turn around. Which brings us to the third and obvious function, uh, the soil mineral function, this thing that I, as a trainee farmer and certainly wasn't taught at university, was totally blind to. That's that whole zoo underground, <coughs> which is the real secret. And I'll just give you one quick example. That one of those wonderful parts of that zoo are the, the uh, root fungus, mycorrhizal fungi, which there's quite a few types. And that fuzzy stuff on the right is their invisible feeding tubes, their hyphae. And they have a partnership, plants have a partnership. Um, sorry, the, the fungi have a partnership with plants that uh, in exchange for the root exudates and sugars, uh, they have this symbiotic role to then go out and source the nutrients and the micronutrients and the minerals for the plant. And in a healthy cubic metre of soil, there could be 25,000 kilometres of these hyphae working away. You go in and plough, spray, fertilise, you kill off all that function. And you've got your monocultural plants waiting for their drug fix of NPK in essence. And what's the food like off that? It's probably only a minuscule percent of the integral nutrients that we're co-evolved for to have for our health. So this is drastic stuff. And I won't bore you with some of the new developments in cropping. There's a whole variety. Uh, cropping into um, C4, some are active native grasslands in Australia. They've worked out for one reason or another the innovators that you can crop in in the autumn and then graze it with animals, just as those C4 grasses are going dormant. You can grow your cereals and edible canolas and wheats and stuff. And then as you're harvesting, those plants are waking up. And so you've stacked on your green solar panels for a lot more of the year than that shot in the middle, which is your traditional industrial cereal crop. And in Australia, once you harvest, in Western Australia and the Mediterranean belt, you've got soil exposed for up to five months to the sun, killing the biology. And just to finish on these innovators, this remarkable family that I write about in my book, farming on 3.8 billion year old soils, and beet sand to you guys, uh, they've totally eliminated industrial chemicals as they sow their cereals, they combine uh, worm juice, vermijuice with compost extract, wrap it around the seed. And uh, in the last couple of years, they're now starting to pass their industrial neighbours in yield, but they've eliminated over 90% of their costs. And they're, they're basing it off ever regenerating grasslands. It's, it's radical stuff that now shows we can, we can do it in a different way. And you would have all heard of Gabe Brown, the pioneer in North America of multi-species covers. In different continents, there seems to be a minimum number you need to stimulate all that biology and diversity. And this is just a quick example of, of impact of Gabe up in North Dakota. That his, his soil on the bottom of the shovel, you can see the beautiful aggregation and the worms and stuff, uh, 
his rainfall penetration now, uh, his first inch disappears in nine seconds, second inch in 16 seconds. That's his neighbour 40 metres away over the fence, which is what he was like um, 12 years before. Uh, the penetration there, you can see how hard it is. Uh, first inch takes two hours to go in. So it's sort of no-brainer stuff once you get the biology and the structure going. And so this soil organic carbon is the secret. Uh, you get those microhousal fungi and all that biology and stuff laying down deeper and longer lasting glomulins and the other magic carbons and, and you get a transformation. <coughs> and just quickly I'll finish with the fourth function, the biodiversity or dynamic ecosystems. Integral in pest control both above and beneath the ground, the insects and birds, etc. Uh, don't have to talk to the uh, Iberian Peninsula farmers about it, they've been doing it for centuries with their uh, montados and dehisas in their oak landscapes, animals grazing in oak landscapes. <coughs> One example in Australia, this, this family in um, what was reasonably forested country on the left, uh, in 1994 that got down to only 2% of vegetation and, and the wheels were falling off, they were getting salinity, more and more diseases, carvings and lambings were dropping. So they devoted another 20% of the farm putting it back into agroforestry. The strainer post in those photos, that's the same strainer post on the left as on the right near where um, Andrew Stewart's leaning. So that's the same marker. Uh, despite putting 20% out for biodiversity planning, their overall production's up 25%. And they've stacked in another six or seven enterprises, which has, has enabled his three daughters to come and live and work on the farm. Uh, not just from forestry, but farm tourism and and uh, what we call bush tucker and, and beekeeping, etc. So their social and ecological resilience has gone up. So that's the sort of uh, how, to, how to do it in um, 101 quickly. Um, how do we then address the big issues? How does this address as we go into the Anthropocene? I've shown you that before, uh, but I'm arguing that regenerative agriculture has many of the key solutions to our dilemma. A dilemma that some of the leading scientists think we're going to have to take drastic action within two or three decades or it'll be too late. And recently I've got to know Paul Hawken, uh, many of you would be aware, uh, uh, Patrick mentioned him earlier, leading social environmental thinker for decades. And he got sick, about 15 years ago, he got sick of asking the climate scientists, okay, doesn't look good, what do we do about it? And he said nearly all of them said, well, we don't know, we're just crunching the... Uh, chemistry and, and the physics. So he went off and, and co-opted 80 uh, scientists and analysts and said, let's come up with the 100 best methods of pulling carbon dioxide down or preventing it going up. And they published this book, Drawdown. And getting to know him, I looked through the top 30 or so and I said, um, Paul, there's seven or eight methods there that you could call regenerative agriculture, all doing the same thing. Let's put them together and just call them regen ag. The answer is by nearly two and a half times the next best method, Regen Ag is number one by a country mile at addressing that carbon dioxide issue and everything that goes with it, acidifying oceans, etc. And just recently we've had in Australia the first carbon credit awarded under the Paris Agreement. To, I visited this guy about six weeks ago. Um, he's developed a machine, but basically it's multi-species covers. Uh, with integrated grazing and is turning light coloured white soil into dark chocolate within two years. It's quite remarkable. And this is the other big context, human ill health, all related to what I've just been talking about. And again, we're in the belly of the snake on this because they're exponentially rising all our modern diseases. And that's what I'm saying, it's, it's, it's no accident that the same charts for the modern diseases from autism to uh, ADHD to your cancers and obesity has the same trajectory as those socioeconomic and biophysical great acceleration things. The two are inseparably linked. And I'll say quite confidently, for all the evidence, more and more and more coming. Industrial agriculture destroys food nutrient availability, diversity and quality and delivers man-made poisons into our industrial foods. A lot of glyphosate now appearing in a lot of the industrial foods that are being tested. And I won't go through it, there are now dozens and dozens of papers, your own um, 
government here has uh, published some good data on this. The drop in the more we push maximum industrial production and, and breeding what were once adapted wheat and, and other cereal varieties for a dwarf maximum focus on production and response to fertilisers, etc., the more there is a penalty, and that penalty is a collapse in nutrient availability, and some of that for the reasons I've described, like lack of mycorrhizal fungi. And this is just one looking at 63 bread, the soft white, the bread wheats, a few years ago, uh, with a crash in a lot of really crucial nutrients, critical for our immune and, and physiological function. Dozens of papers now. And that crash is due, yes, to over-processing processing of food, so white goods can survive on a shelf for you know, over a year, uh, not much alive in that. Uh, genetic modification of complex genomics, uh, having done a fair bit of genetics and worked with molecular geneticists, we fiddle with nature's design at great risk. It's very rare that you don't get some nasty surprise from doing it. But most of the decline in nutrients is related to this decline in soil health. The lack of those bugs sourcing the nutrients for us. That's where our nutrient-poor foods are coming from and that's directly related, as we're finding out more and more, to the modern ill health. <coughs> but there is this second alarming issue. Glyphosate now is the world's most widely used herbicide, nearly a, a million tonnes going out per year. And the evidence on it uh, is mounting. So it's really the elephant in the room which we're trying to suppress and, and all of us, I, I certainly have, have used it in, over our lives. It's, but we now know it's penetrating our food and water and those of our animals. And we're now finding out, more and more evidence to show, it's having devastating impact. And the scientists like Bob Kramer, who used to work for the USDA, and, and um, Professor Don Huber, now in his 80s, uh, since the early 1980s, he's been talking constantly about his concern for what glyphosate is doing to uh, soil, animal and human health. And, and he'll run a two-day workshop just on glyphosate if you want him to. He's got that much evidence. He's widely respected across the spectrum. And I won't go through all the impact it's having on the microbial world and physiological function, but uh, the evidence is mounting. And of course it's targeted at this, our second brain, our gut microbiome, nearly weighs the same weight as our cerebral brain, uh, and particularly those microbes, etc., in there that we can't see. But you could summarise a lot of the work that there are two key reasons why it's emerging as one of the worst elements in our environment. And the first is it interferes in, in what's called the shikimati pathway, which is a function of our microbial world in the amino acid production pathway. So the making of critical proteins and hormones and enzymes integral to immune and other function, and it's chopping that off at its last few stages, rendering us more defenceless uh, with, through the lack of those critical uh, messengers and enzymes and hormones. But glyphosate's water soluble, and we now know once your defences are rendered uh, less impenetrable, like your gut lining, it's penetrating uh, things like your gut lining and the blood-brain barrier, and possibly even more sensitive linings like embryonic and placental linings. And there's doctors like Zach Bush and others now looking at this microbial disturbance with clear indicators that pattern, disturbed patterns in the human gut look like to be integ integrally related to some of the modern diseases. Not saying glyphosate's the so sole cause, but it's certainly emerging as a key player. <coughs> and the other thing that looks to be happening is that other form of genetic inheritance, not transformation in DNA, but the switching on and off of genes, what's called epigenetics. That we get disturbed food, all chemicals in our gut are switching genes on and off that are undesirable. It's happening in the soil as well. So it's our choice. I'm arguing that regenerative agriculture can help save the planet and ourselves, or we can continue to roll a load of dice. And um, the odds are stacked hugely against success from that. And we've probably all seen this, the guy that gave us the modern medical ethics, ethics Hippocrates, nearly two and a half thousand years ago, it's attributed to him, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And it's so true about a full nutrient-rich diet coming off healthy soils. And that, you needn't look at the detail, but there's already four big major court case awards, subject to appeal, I know, but against Monsanto, Bayer, 
another four and a half, four, another 14,500 claimants lined up. Chances are it's going to be banned at some stage, particularly here in, in Europe. Uh, and that'll be one of the shocks to the system that's going to have to be addressed. So can we profitably, regeneratively and healthily graze and farm without industrial chemicals? Absolutely. Small and large acres, it's being done now and profitably. How do we do it? I'm arguing one farm, one paddock at a time. Being done on millions of hectares worldwide now. How do we do it? Well, we're not going to do it alone as farmers. We have to partner with our urban consumers and their activation into community gardens and awareness about healthy food versus industrial food. And this is a huge one. Uh, with these devices, et cetera, et cetera, our young generations are being increasingly divorced from that intimate connection with Mother Nature. That mechanical mind is being further separated. We have to get kids back, as in that bottom right photo, to start wondering about nature and engaging and learning with her. Can we do it? Yes. As Charles Darwin said, <clears throat> it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It's the one that is the most adaptable to change. We're right in that narrow window now. Uh, as an Australian farmer would say, we have to extract our digit and get on with it very quickly. So I'll quickly wrap up. Dramatic, maybe. I personally think we're right on the edge. Probably only two or three decades to really get on with it or we could get into uncontrolled climate events, etc. And I'm saying we have to get beyond that just tread water phase. We have to get to a new agriculture that triggers self-organisation back to health, that triggers those earth capacities. And as Gus Speth said, a leading environmental thinker, today's problems can't be solved with today's mind. We've got to change that square foot of real estate before we can change our landscapes. Or as an old farmer said to me the other day, the thinking that got us in the shit won't get us out of it. We've got to overthrow these 10,000 years of tradition and metaphor, what we do to the soil. And so I put to you the law of the turtle. Behold, the turtle he only makes progress when he sticks his neck out. And we've got to combine the best of the mechanical and the organic mind. I'm not saying we get rid of uh, modern science. We desperately need the best of it, but we have to have that marriage with that concept that what we do to the mother, we're doing to ourselves, and it's getting more and more drastic. So I'm, I'm arguing that regenerative agri agriculture has profound solutions for our challenging times. We have key solutions for the Anthropocene crisis. We've got an agriculture that enables this self-healing of natural systems. We've got key solutions to the human health crisis, a crisis that could destroy in, any modern economy uh, within two or three decades. And so the last thought I'll leave you with from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, because this story of growth and greed is failing us desperately. And as he said, the ultimate test of a moral society is the kind of world we leave to our children. So I'll leave you there and um, pass over to Patrick. Thanks, Patrick. <laughs>